like to introduce our 2013 OSA president. So I'll go through some of the hard facts. McMaster University, 1981. University of Rochester, where she got her PhD in optics in 1989, and that's when she worked with her supervisor, Gerard Monroe. And that's where they co-invented the Chirp Pulse Amplification CPA, different kind of CPA, what we're used to. Uh, which made it possible to amplify ultra-short pulses at unprecedented levels. She then went on to the National Research Council in Canada, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, Princeton Advanced Technology Center, and then she joined the physics department at the University of Waterloo, where she has done a tremendous amount of work there. She's been recognized in many ways, Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellow, the Premier's Research Excellent Award, the Cottrell Scholars Award of Research from Research Corporation, and also a little thing called the Fellowship from OSA in 2008. Um, but most importantly, she's done an enormous amount of work with us. She was on the board in 2005 to 2007 before she was president. She's done work in meetings. She's done work in publications. She's done work in governance. She's done all kinds of activities with us. She's dragged along her daughter, Hannah, her son, Adam, and her husband, Doug, which they all seem like they really were having a good time. Um, she introduced us to um, ice wine, being from Canada, and she proved the Canadians are the most friendly people we've ever met, ever. So please join me in congratulating Donna on her Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, first, I was just asked, like, two days after I won the Nobel Prize if I would just come and party. And then I went, yes. And then somehow it turned into <laughs> a half an hour talk. I'm not going to talk for half an hour. I can talk a lot, but, you know. Um, and then in OSA fashion, because when I was president or on the chain and sent around the world, they always gave me talking points, okay? And they always tried very hard to make me sound professional. I now have a full-time communications person at the University of Waterloo trying very hard to make me sound professional. It's almost impossible. Um, and so I quite often like to stand uh, when I give talks in front of the OSA staff people and see how I don't know, scared they start looking, because you just never know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I might use some of their talking points, but uh, let me just uh, tell you about my life here at OSA sort of through the uh, four years on the executive chain. First of all, I want to say that Liz is a fantastic uh, CEO because she seems to size us up for the first year or two, and then she tells us our best points and that we should uh, go with those. And so she said to me, I think you should uh, go out and see as many student groups as you can. And I went, great. That sounds like a great idea. So I did a lot. I thought at the time I was doing a lot of traveling, but now I've seen my schedule for next year, and it's like pales in comparison. Um, so I did go and travel a lot. So I'm just going to tell you about three of the trips that stand out in my mind. I think the most impressive one was the 60th anniversary of CIOMP. That was like the largest OSA group that we ever put together to go somewhere. I think there were a dozen of us, maybe. And I don't think the North Americans in the crowd, and most of the OSA people were North Americans in the crowd, um, really understood uh, how important science is to the Asian side of the uh, globe. Uh, and so there were TV cameras there to celebrate the 60th anniversary, and there was a red carpet to walk on, and it was like, oh my goodness, this is a really big deal. Who knew that science could be such a big deal to the general public? So that was an eye-opening experience. Byung Ho Lee was one of the 12, and so I don't know why I was the one who would get up and speak first, and so I was the one who did the official congratulations from OSA. And so he sat me down, and he looked very hard in explaining to me the proper order of who, you know, which names should come first based on some Asian understanding of what that would be, because I didn't get it. But I'm sure he was correct, and that I did it correctly. And I thought of that when I got my Nobel binder. I'll tell you, the Nobel binder has 15 um, things in it. You get the first week after you win. Just explaining what the 10 days in Sweden is going to be like for me. And somewhere in those 15 sections of the binder, it actually does say, if you're the one who gives the speech in front of royalty, this is the order that you will uh, acknowledge everybody. So 
um, just to be royally correct as opposed to politically correct. Um, so that's one that stands out. I've seen the pictures uh, going by that I took with Kari to Brazil. And I think every time uh, Kari and I get together, we remember this wonderful trip to Brazil. Now, not only because we wore silly things uh, <laughs> in Rio de Janeiro, which is what the picture's of, but we were at an IAMS meeting in Campinas. And the hotel that we got taken to was off to this, like outside of town on the side of this road. And we went off to have a drinking party with the students the one night. And there's that great Brazilian drink. What's the name of that great Brazilian drink? It's just so tasty. It's exactly, okay, great. <laughs> so they gave us really big ones. So that might have been part of the problem. But we get back to the hotel, and, and the old people left before the students did. And so it was just us. And I get to my hotel room, and there's a horse with its butt right up against the door to my hotel room. And it didn't want to move. And we're all standing there going, we're seeing it. We're all seeing this, right? <laughs> It's not just me. And, and no, really, there was a horse there. And we found out that the, it had just switched from being a horse riding camp to a hotel uh, a few months earlier. And I guess they just let the horses roam wild. I don't know. So those are three of my great trips. So one of the other memories that stand out is that just the night before you take the gavel at the OSA annual meeting in October, you host the uh, student party. Now, where's Steve Fantone? Is he here? Did he leave? going to mess with my story about Steve. <laughs> so it was a karaoke night. A, I can't sing, so nobody should ask me to sing. And I said, no. And the students all said, no, no, you got to be careful. And I went, no. Well, then there's Steve and Betsy Fantone. And they decided that they would have some song. I, I think it's Doc of the Bay, but Caroline? no. Oh, sorry. I don't, it doesn't matter. <laughs> they, and they gathered my friend Carl Koch and Jim Kafka, and the five of us went up. And I thought, well, I can stand in the back and not really sing, and we'll just do it that way. OK, fine. Well, there's one point, though, where there is no singing. And so Carl and I just sort of danced on the stage, but there was a little rug on the stage. And my heel caught. And down I went in front of all the students. And I had a drink that was just, um, I wish it was club soda, because that would just be water. But no, it was tonic water. So I'm now, it, just, it went up and down over me, so I'm a sticky mess, OK? Down on the floor, looking like, this is who your incoming president is, student. <laughs> aren't, aren't you impressed? And. But then, it really shows you how helpful OSA staff people always want to be. Because before I could even get myself up off the floor, I had three OSA staff people with paper towels already in their hands <laughs> trying to mop me up. OK? Yeah, so that was it. So, but I'm just going to tell you the other story of Steve Fantone. Steve, I, I am the one who broke him, OK? <laughs> 15 years that man was OSA's treasurer. And one year with me as president, and he went, <laughs> I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and he had to call me up, and he, and he had to say, no, Donna, I just can't be treasurer anymore. So luckily, he left us with uh, George Bayes, and that's fantastic. But um, you know, and obviously, Steve is going to be an incoming president. And I'm sure he thought if Donna can do it, anybody can. <laughs> he didn't fall on the floor when he was up there dancing, so he should be OK. So that was it. So now I'll tell you some of the more serious ones. One of the really great things you get to do as OSA president is call the person that the Presidential Advisory Committee has asked to be an honorary member. And I got to uh, phone Stephen Harris at Stanford University. And that man could not have been nicer and more humble and just more appreciative of being given that honor. And we just had this great phone conversation. And I just thought that was great. Now, it just turns out that in my Nobel lecture, which I can't talk about before I give it, but nevertheless, I'll tell you one little thing. There's going to be a picture of uh, Stephen Harris on one of my slides. And now, you know, we have to do it legitimately. So we are making sure we have all the permissions before we show anybody's face. And so he was contacted. Um, and he was just really surprised that I would be showing his picture. So I've emailed him back to explain what small role that he unwittingly um, played in getting me a Nobel Prize, because he didn't know. So, um, so we had another lovely email exchange over that. So that was great. So now I think just the last thing I want to talk about is one of the big achievements in uh, 2013 that the OSA um, took on was they decided to be one of the key players in the National Photonics Initiative. Okay, so that got launched in 2013. And um, Tom Baer, who was one of the first people out there with it and one of the real movers and shakers of it, he came to me and, and he said, you know, I know that you're president this year of OSA, but you, you really can't be the OSA's representative on 
NPI. And I went, I get that. The, the, the nation in the NPI is not my nation. And so I, obviously, I shouldn't be the one pushing for the US. It could have called the US Photonics <laughs> Initiative. And I said, that's OK. But when you get it up and running, I think you should start an international one. You know, because certainly Canada could also use OSA's help. And when you do that, you know, please ask me um, to help with that. So he went ahead and, and did help with the NPI and then handed that over. And he started up an international photonics advocacy coalition. I'm going to go with coalition for the C. I think that's right. And he asked me to be part of IPAC. And so I happily said yes. Since I had asked to be uh, put on it, how could I say no? And uh, so that was great. And then we go to an IPAC meeting. And he puts up all the people that are on the IPAC. And, and he says to all of us, uh, you were chosen because you all you know, have really good connections with your science policy people in your government. And I'm going, mm, I don't. <laughs> I just you know, thought I wanted to help Canada, but I don't. Anyway, <laughs> I kept my mouth shut. I just went along with it. And then we had a meeting about a year ago, and we couldn't get anybody. So this meeting, we've decided what IPAC should work on is photonics for environmental measurement and monitoring, which I know nothing about because I've never worked in that field. But nevertheless, I said, OK, if that's what we're going to do, let's do that. And we got a meeting going in Canada. And we could not get anybody from Environment Canada to show up to our meeting. So I had to go back to, you know, and think, what could we do? And so we decided that we should have an incubator meeting in Canada uh, with just the scientists from you know, the Environment Canada all the way to the photonics people, the industry people, the standards people, the spectroscopists. We'll all get together. And as scientists, we'll decide what a good pitch would be so that the government would want to listen to us. That happened on November 8th this year. Now, before November 8th, about three days before that, the president of the National Research Council wanted to have a meeting with me. And he was at the University of Waterloo that day. And so we were having a meeting. And I said, well, I'm running this. Uh, or I'm not running it. <laughs> I've given up running it. But I'm helping organize a meeting that's at NRC Boucherville. You know? So he didn't know anything about it. But of course, just before November 8th, in fact, October 2nd, it was announced that I had won a Nobel Prize. <laughs> And I'm telling you, all you have to do is win a Nobel Prize <laughs> to get your government to care, OK? And so I have now talked to uh, the Minister of Science. And I have been kissed on both cheeks by my prime minister. That was a thrill. Because <laughs> not only is he a great prime minister, but he's also a gorgeous guy, right? So I mean, let's just go with that. I was just saying, though, I just saw him with the very same pose as my favorite photo with him, with Doug Ford, who is the premier of Ontario. Anyway, um, it's all right. I still love that picture. <laughs> <laughs> but so now, um, because I told the president of NRC that we were going to have this meeting at NRC Boucherville, next thing you know, the VP in charge of NRC Boucherville is opening the meeting. And he's invited the deputy um, minister, associate deputy minister for what used to be called Environment Canada, but now has a longer name, Environment and Climate Change Canada, uh, to come. And she was just bubbling with enthusiasm over photonics for uh, monitoring the environment. And I've now been invited to her meeting that she's running for climate change research workshop in February as a keynote speaker. So all you have to do is win a Nobel Prize, <laughs> and you can get to know your government leaders. So I, I, yeah, I think with that, I have really nothing else to say. You just have to get a Nobel Prize, and, and, <laughs> and, and doors open for you. So thank you. Donnie, you make us all feel like we won the Nobel Prize. Thank <laughs> and you. we want to keep everyone smiling and laughing <laughs> with you. So I've been asked to play uh, Phil Donahue and okay. some questions. Are so you, I hope there's some how questions old you are. You can't even be old enough to know who Phil Donahue is. <laughs> You have to be as old as me to know who Phil Donahue is. So I hope there's some questions for Donna. I'll be happy to run out and, and help you with. So, so um, in, the, in the course of the time since you developed chirp pulse amplification, uh, obviously a lot has happened with, with uh, ultra-fast lasers. And there's now you know, lasers of you know, previously almost inconceivable uh, pulse power you know, intensity coming on board people talk about things like boiling the vacuum and and you know other sort of more practical applications what 
is to you the most exciting thing that you're looking at you know, in the road ahead for pulse lasers that your work kind of got started? Okay, so I'm just gonna uh, preface that by saying that Gerard Maru and I had a great time doing this project together, but Gerard and I have very different personalities, okay? Uh, and Gerard wants to be way out there ahead of the wave at all times, right? Gerard, as I can tell you, when we were students, his uh, advice to us was always be revolutionary, not evolutionary. So, um, so he's out there wanting to do these big things. Um, I'm somebody who just wants to be in my own little lab. I didn't realize how reclusive of a person I am until this happened, and I went, okay, people, I just need some time all by myself because I'm usually by myself 90% of the time, uh, and that's what I like. It's not that I don't love people, but usually about 10% of the time, and then I have to be all by myself. Um, so I'm working on something just because uh, I'm just trying to make a whole lot of colors to make single femtosecond stuff because my colleague is wanting to make stop motion molecular movies, and so I'll be the laser person for that. Uh, but along the way, when we were trying to make all these colors, all of a sudden all these extra colors showed up and, and that stopped us from making the short pulse because we went, where are those colors coming from? And uh, we're still trying to struggle to figure it out. So I just, I just like to find my own thing that nobody else in the whole world is working on. Uh, many other people have seen these extra colors. They just ignored them because it's not part of the picture of making a lot of colors. But yeah, I'm not somebody who's, you know, that doesn't mean I don't love watching Gerard's movies where he's going to move, move satellites out or, um, you know, I, he had me go to CERN uh, when I was OSA president to talk about uh, his, his great idea of ICANN and the fact that let's not build a bigger CERN, let's uh, do uh, Wakefield acceleration and, uh, and have that. I think a lot of people are trying to do uh, accelerators for hospitals that, you know, that obviously seems a lot more in the realm of, of you know, in my lifetime we'll see. Um, and hopefully, you know, do things like cure brain cancer. I'm, I'm all for that. Certainly that is, as I understand it, one of the main motivating reasons why places in Europe are willing to build these petawatt lasers. Because I asked that, right? Like, why do your governments want to uh, spend the money on that? Because and now I have to say that the North American, the National Academy of Sciences, wrote a report this last year saying, you know, we're being left in the dust. This started in the United States, and, um, and we're not really playing in the field the same way as the, the Asians. The Asians are definitely leading everybody at this point, but uh, Eli's coming on strong, too, in Europe. So, But who knows? Yeah, no, no. Uh, and we'll clean up nuclear waste. They're all wonderful things. I just don't personally want to work on great big-scale things. I'm, I'm a, like, I always love building Lego with a kid, so I like to do small things that I can have my hands on all by myself. Other questions? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about balancing your motherhood and your career and maybe joys and sorrows and advice with that? There's no winning. Okay, so here's, here's the one story I always talk about is that um, my children were, were raised Jewish. Um, I can't tell you my son's joke because he's a comedian, and once they say it's on TV, which it is, then you know you can't say it. So I'm not going to give you his joke. But what I will say um, was that one Passover comes along, and my son has decided he's now agnostic. Not, I don't think he's, he might even be atheist, but I think he's agnostic. Uh, and he said, I don't want to do Passover. And I said, well, I've never been Jewish, and I want to do Passover. So that's <laughs> really no reason. To say that, I said, this is a time where the family gets together and we sit down and we have this wonderful meal together. And he said, Mom, if you were an ordinary mother and had no time to have dinner with us all the time, then that would be special. But you make us sit down every night and have dinner together, so what's so special? So there I was trying very hard for the work balance thing, and, and what does it get you? Nothing. So, so I think people should all give themselves a break and just do what the heck they want, which I did want to sit down with my family, which is, it wasn't that I was doing it for my kids. I was doing it. I was always doing it for me. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I tried to, to be pretty balanced about it. What's the coolest thing that's happened to you since you won your Nobel Prize? Other than being kissed by the Prime Minister? Um, I think, you know, well, there's so many I mean, amazing things. Let me, I don't know what I should say on TV because you're, you're, you're filming this. So, but let me just tell you that. Uh, I will go um, with the, my Canadian guest, so Liz is not invited to this part, um, to the uh, Canadian Embassy. And I, I pick 12 Canadians, and then there will be 12 Swedes picked to meet 
talk with me at the embassy in Sweden. And they said, you know, is there anything Swedish you really want to do? Now, where's the guy who's playing tennis? Because this is really your story. Yes. She's left here. Everybody I talk about. Anyway, um, <laughs> so uh, three years ago, another Canadian one for physics, uh, Art McDonald, and they said, you know, when he came, he's a huge hockey fan. Like, he doesn't every Canadian, not me. Um, <laughs> And so we arranged, I didn't even let her finish what they arranged because I have no interest in hockey. And so, that shouldn't be on tape because now all my Canadians are going to hate me. Um, I said, no, no, I'm a big tennis fan. And they went, oh, so should we try to get Bjorn Borg? I went, oh my goodness, why don't you try to get Bjorn Borg? Like, just because I've won a Nobel Prize, you know. Now that he, should, he goes, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if he'll come. So, you know, we don't know if he'll come. But I, just, just the even fact that somebody would reach out to him to say, don't you want to meet me? It's like, what the heck? <laughs> you know, and I won't be hurt if he says no, but it's just, you know, even that he's being asked. I think that's amazing. Um, you know, again, after all of uh, my guests leave, uh, the next day, after the big, you know, there's going to be 1,500 of us dining with the royal family at the big celebration on the 10th, which is Nobel's birthday. But on the 11th, just the laureates and their spouses go to the palace to dine with the entire royal family. And you see that, and you go, how did this, you know, Canadian girl who just went to grad school and did a project end up being invited to a palace to dine with royalty? I, you know, it's just one of those weird things that just happened because life just, I've just been under, you know, I was born under a lucky star and it just keeps happening for me. It's always amazing to me. So. Oh. <laughs> Applaud my luck. It's true. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank Let's you. have another round of applause for Donna for speaking with us.